Hello, welcome to the 21st uh, lecture of this course. So today we are going to talk about the abelian Higgs mechanism and the non abelian version will be in the next lecture. Before we go into all that, we uh, have to note, make note of certain stuff that uh, the feature of gauge field theory, which is irrespective of whether it's abelian or non abelian, which is that the mass of the gauge bosons. So we have not explicitly talked about what's the mass of the gauge boson but usually if, if, if a quantum particle has a mass then it usually appears in its propagator like for fermion and and the scalar we already know but when we are talking about the propagator uh, when we are talking that the propagator could not be inverted and all that we notice that there was no mass term and that's because the Lagrangian doesn't have a term like this okay uh, uh, m square m u m u had there been a term like that we would have uh, had the mass term for the gauge bosons but what happens that this term is actually not a gauge invariant term so the the mass term which which is the typical mass term that one would like to have it violates the gauge symmetry and that what makes that uh, uh, theory with gauge symmetry Ha has uh, massless gauge bosons so all the gauge bosons that we have talked about till now the u1 gauge boson that is photon is one of the example of uh, u1 gauge boson and it is massless it's a, as long as the gauge symmetry is a good symmetry the corresponding gauge bosons will be massless however uh, you know there are some dynamical way in which one can generate the masses of this and uh, what we are going to talk about uh, is, is uh, one such classical model not the quantum dynamical model for generation of mass so now uh, just for you know making uh, the uh, go ahead uh, making some progress about how do we deal with the mass well let's consider this lagrangian where you know usual f mu f mu term is there and then i just simply add 1 by 2 m square f a mu a mu and Obviously, this the whole Lagrangian is not invariant under m u goes to m u plus del mu alpha. Okay, so this this is what leads to the explicit violation of the gauge symmetry. Only this term, the first term we already know is a, is a symmetric under such gauge transformation. So what we have is the explicit violation of the gauge symmetry, but my pi zero is still zero. Okay, so remember in the u n gauge boson case, we had. Uh, apart from having the gauge symmetry which means that two different gauge configuration different by you know just tell me alpha are basically describing the same physics here we do not have that okay so there are no gauge orbits over here each of the amu is a different amu but we still have pi zero equal to zero that means we still have more number of degrees of freedom than the physical particle described by this Lagrangian has. So forget about the gauge symmetry, it's not gauge invariant. It is explicitly broken. That's a very important thing to say. The word explicit is that this term that exists over here does not uh, respect the gauge symmetry. It explicitly violates it. Now having pi zero equal to zero indicates that gauge of uh, number of degrees of freedom to be counted properly. And we have already seen in the case of uh, u1 gauge boson that a0 basically can be written in terms of ai's and ai's dot so basically that remains true over here as well so a0 is not really a dynamical degree of freedom so pi 0 is uh, corresponding momenta is 0 and a0 can be written in terms of other fields using the equation of motion so as far as the on shell real particle satisfying this Lagrangian is described by this Lagrangian is concerned then we basically have three degrees of freedom so they are basically three degrees of freedom and this corresponding equation of motion is called Proca equation and it is describes a massive spin one boson which actually have three polarization states so we know that uh, spin s state has two s plus one uh, spin uh, s particle has two s plus one states spin states spin one particle should have uh, three states it's not very surprising that we are getting three degrees of freedom over here what is surprising is that for photon we are getting only two degrees of freedom and that because of its masslessness it loses one of the degrees of freedom okay. so um, in, in 
particle physics, we actually require massive spin one bosons. So there are several uh, spin one particles that were found. As some of them are not fundamental particles, so that's okay. But even if you want to describe them using uh, some Lagrangian, then uh, I want basically a Lagrangian that has a massive spin one particle. Okay. And uh, there was also some hints uh, in the charge current, uh, beta decay and all that, that the intermediate gauge boson is actually very massive. Okay. So I, the question is, can we have gauge symmetric Lagrangian where the gauge boson is massive? So I want my entire Lagrangian to be gauge invariant. So I don't want this term, this explicitly symmetry breaking term over here. I definitely don't want that. Okay, this term. But I still want them to be massive. So first of all, if I want, uh, you know, what this equation, what this Proca Lagrangian says, is that if you want them to be massive, you have to give up the gauge symmetry. So the quest over here is that I start with the gauge symmetry and something breaks this symmetry, okay? And that particular mechanism is called the Higgs mechanism. Okay. So we, we have uh, uh, the, the particular situation is called spontaneous symmetry breaking as against what we had in the Proca case is the explicit symmetry breaking. So you can't even say that this is symmetry breaking. You just say uh, symmetry is already broken. Symmetry is not respected by this Lagrangian, but here, a spontaneous symmetry breaking is a slightly different concept in a way that your Lagrangian and hence the equation of motion all have the right symmetry, the gauge symmetry is there, okay? But the ground state of the, uh, of the Hamiltonian somehow does not respect uh, the, the symmetries, okay? So that is called the spontaneous symmetry breaking. Let's look at the U1 Higgs model, which is to say you have U1 gauge symmetry of a scalar field. Okay, so you have minus 1 by 4 F mu F mu, then you have d mu phi, di d mu phi, then there are some extra pieces over here. So uh, minus of uh, minus mu square phi dagger phi, and then lambda times phi dagger phi whole square. So this is the mass term kind of thing is there, and we know that I'm writing with a wrong sign. Okay, and this lambda phi dagger phi is there which is uh, just a four, form, four uh, uh, scalar interaction, four charge scalar interaction. So this, this two terms can be written as potential of phi dagger, potential term, which is a function of phi dagger phi, written as minus mu square phi dagger phi plus lambda phi dagger phi whole square. Now here, uh, my d mu phi is written as del mu minus i g a mu times phi, phi goes to exponential i g alpha x phi x, and then a mu transforms as a mu, going to minus i del mu alpha x. So this is the definition of covariant derivative and these two are the transformation properties. Okay. Then notation here is just a copy of what the notation we used for the non-abelian case. For the abelian, yeah, remember we had used slightly different uh, notation when we discussed the abelian uh, U1 model for the first time. So there was this plus sign was there and some other conventions were different. This was also plus. It was basically changing alpha to minus alpha. Okay. So uh, now what happens, what's so specific about this? So if you just look at this V, this, this potential, and plot it as a function of phi mod, you see, if I, uh, this, this is a function of phi mod only, because it's phi mod square and phi mod to the power four is what appears over here. And if phi, which is a complex field, changes its phase, it doesn't change the potential. So I can actually write V of phi mod as a function of just V of phi mod, is a phi mod, and as a function of phi mod, uh, actually I should not have written the negative side because phi mod is, is just a real number, but just to you know depict that how it changes as a function of phi mod. So uh, when uh, you have uh, this mu square, okay, so this is opposite sign. So let me call mu square to be negative. Okay, so this coefficient is positive coefficient and lambda is co uh, positive coefficient. Okay, so what I basically mean is here this lambda is certainly greater than zero, and uh, this particular case, okay, here mu square is negative, here mu square is zero, and here last one, here I write it 
mu square is positive so when mu square is negative then minus mu square is a positive then what happens this is uh, is a quadratic uh, term going upward this is a quartic term going upward so eventually what we have is this sharply growing uh, shape of the potential where minima is sitting at zero okay so this one has a minima at zero so this is basically when minus mu square is greater than zero right? which is same as mu square is less than zero and v of phi has a minima at phi mod equal to zero this is a symmetric phase and then this is the usual scalar qed that we have but for minus mu square less than zero okay which is a mu square is positive then v of phi have two this distinct minima okay so here i should not say two distinct minima I basically you take just one side and rotate it in the three dimension okay so this is just a section of that uh, mexican hat shape that usually people say so this this lower line is kind of your mexican hat right so uh, so this particular v and all possible phases uh, around multiplied around v is is uh, is the minima okay so we have a continuous continuous ring of minima over here okay and mod phi for that minima is is uh, can be obtained by just minimizing this as a function of phi mod and you get phi mod equal to square root of mu square divided by 2 lambda okay and i can just parameterize this as v by uh, root 2 where v is just uh, mu square by lambda square root okay so what happens basically uh, here is that uh, this kind of model is available in uh, spontaneous symmetry without this you know, gauge interaction and uh, this complicated kinetic piece just the potential part is the free energy for uh, magnets okay so what you have uh, minus mu square can be said as some co cons positive constant a multiplied by t minus tc so when t is greater than tc t is greater than tc so this number is positive so minus mu square is a positive number okay minus mu square is positive number so you have this uh, nice parabolic shape this is a symmetric phase so your magnetization phi is kind of magnetization magnetization is zero okay when t is less than tc then you have a symmetry broken phase because when t is less than tc this minus mu square is negative so mu square is positive you have this double well potential and then your magnetization basically to minimize energy you have to have a non-zero magnetization so this kind of model is used uh, just the potential part of it uh, in, in uh, to describe the magnetic properties of matter okay so this is a second order phase transition as one studies in uh, condensed matter system okay but similar thing uh, here what we have is that uh, what, what it means that this phi has a minima is that the vacuum expectation value of phi is not zero usually if you put phi over there and if you have this a's and a dagger so either a kills to the right or a dagger kills to the left now i don't have that phi dagger uh, the vacuum expectation of phi is some v by root 2 okay this is what we have the minima value so the phi is not just a linear combination of a's and a daggers it also has some constant piece so if i write phi as uh, phi is a complex field so i write it as linear combination of two uh, real scalar uh, phi 1 plus i phi 2 by root 2 this root 2 normalization is there to make sure that it creates a equal norm uh, proper normed uh, states when you generate on act it on the vacuum now if i just write this term over here uh, in terms of phi 1 and phi 2 what, what i get is that vacuum expectation value of phi 1 is v and that is of phi 2 is 0 there's no imaginary part over here so i can write phi of x classically as 1 by root 2 times uh, phi 1 prime plus v so this is this total thing is my phi 1 okay it is as it has a constant piece and it has a field piece now vacuum expectation value of phi 1 prime would be 0 and uh, phi 2 prime is vacuum expectation is 0 anyways so I, I will write it like this i just parameterize in terms of still has two degrees of freedom phi 1 prime and phi 2 okay so in this picture which is not uh, very well drawn over here so you can just say what phi 1 says that move uh well roughly it says at, at the bottom is that the move uh, along one direction and phi 2 will move in the perpendicular direction okay uh, and since it has this nice circular symmetry it would have been nice to use not just the x and y kind of coordinates so to say the real and imaginary part but uh, the the amplitude and the 
uh, as a phase but we'll come to that uh, eventually okay but it's important to see uh, once what happens in terms of this this fields okay so if i uh, write this phi and just write demu phi what it looks like so demu is just del mu minus i g a mu acting on phi 1 prime plus v plus i phi 2 divided by root 2 okay so uh, basically 1 by root 2 remains as it is so del mu acting on this will give me del mu phi 1 prime here and del mu acting on second piece will give me here a del mu phi 2 with i okay and uh, then i times g times a mu with this this piece here will give another this real piece uh, with g a mu phi 2 and other imaginary pieces will come uh, when i g a mu multiply this these two terms which is a real, phi 1 or phi 1 uh, prime plus v uh, because of this we have things so these are the two terms over here okay now we usually use a slang here where when i say a mu square is basically i mean a mu a mu so when i have this d mu phi dagger d mu phi basically i'm saying d mu phi mod square here square means that i'm doing the Lorentz contraction properly so here you see this is the real part and this is the imaginary part so if i take a mod square the real part with real part and imaginary part with imaginary part will come so here is the real part with real part is just del mu phi 1 plus ig uh, a mu phi 2 whole square plus half of uh, uh, this 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 uh, I, i'll take this part separately and this part separately so there will be uh, interference term between them so this del mu phi 2 minus g a mu phi 1 prime whole square if i write okay so this particular term uh, is uh, is the square of this then there will be a square of this term which is written over here and there is a cross term which is written over here important thing to note is just this cross term Okay. apart from various interaction here and there what it has ended up giving is that a mu a mu with g square v square by 2 this is what it has ended up giving okay and here if you look at uh, a term it is a mu phi 1 g a mu phi 1 times uh, g v times a mu so here there is also a mu a mu times some uh, you know v and phi 1 so here this three point vortex is there so such theories uh, if you look at uh, carefully has always had a four point interaction which had a shape uh, let me draw this which which had a shape like this okay and what is happening this is breaking into uh, this piece with i'm just drawing this because both this scalar is replaced by this corresponding vacuum expectation value and then there is this the scalar is there and this is a vacuum expectation value and then of course there it will be a term like that okay the original piece will be there so this particular piece breaks into three pieces basically what you do you take the scalar and then since there are two scalar you put wave one by one onto each okay so that's why you get so many terms and one of the terms obviously when you have both the scalars replaced by corresponding wave you get this diagram corresponding to this okay. okay so this is roughly looks like the mass term with mass of the gauge boson given by gv okay now one can ask for what what do we have over here in terms of degrees of freedom so i, I wrote about it but forgot to mention when we first wrote this so the this first part f menu f menu has two degrees of freedom that's what we counted uh, and uh, when after doing the gauge fixing quantization blah 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 basically f menu f menu describes two degrees of freedom and here's a real sorry complex charged uh, sc uh, scalar so that it has uh, two degrees of freedom because this is phi is equal to uh, phi 1 plus i phi 2 okay so now here i have 2 plus 2 4 degrees of freedom in, into the theory now, but if you look at over here i have phi 1 prime and phi 2 to scalar degrees of freedom as it is now suddenly i have three uh, degrees of freedom for massive amu okay my amu is massive and phi is very same so what's happening and this is the point i wanted to emphasize reason why i wrote uh, phi 1 in this manner so it up apparently looks like that amu has this problem but point is nowhere in this theory 
I said that the key symmetry is not a good symmetry. In fact, my internal first starting Lagrangian is completely gay symmetry. That's where I started with. Just because I choose the wrong sign of mu doesn't make my Lagrangian non-symmetric uh, under gauge transformation. It, uh, it's irrespective of this, this constant being uh, positive, negative, real or complex. Gay symmetry will still hold because gay symmetry transforms the field up to a phase like this and this phase nicely cancels out irrespective of value of this mu square. So if I choose it wrong, but it is still symmetric. Okay. And the remnant of that comes because this, this minima is actually a circle in, in phi plane, real and complex phi plane if I draw, where the minima lies, it's a circle. Okay. We just choose uh, over here for simplicity that the entire wave is in the real direction and in the complex direction there is no vacuum expectation value. V is a vacuum expectation value. Okay. Vacuum expectation value of phi. Or here phi 1. Okay. So just because I chose a different minima, that cannot change the degrees of freedom I have in my theory. That cannot change suddenly the symmetry. Now it so happens that uh, this particular valve, the vacuum expectation value, does have uh, this uh, notion that it, it interferes with the understanding of the symmetry. Okay, so uh, if you look at this particular term carefully, which is written over uh, sorry, this this two term here and here. And here you can see also there is a term which says gv a mu times del mu phi so this is a two-point interaction okay only two fields are sitting at a place all other places whenever two fields are sitting there they are just a kinetic and or the mass term and uh, uh, otherwise more than two fields are sitting which is the interaction term okay but uh, what we see over here is that this particular piece is the one piece where only two fields are sitting just as if a mu and del mu of phi 2 are mixing with each other. So what the mixing here is a so to say hint that the my a mu's that I was talking about uh, along with the gauge symmetry because they have perfectly good gauge symmetry and phi 2 that we have there is certain kind of intertalk between them after I put this particular choice of, uh, of my uh, scalar field. If I write my scalar field in such a manner, then I have this. And because you know this scalar field also transforms, and I, any transformation is possible. So a, uh, as long as alpha is smooth enough, then a mu is also can be chosen to be anything. Now I say that because there's this crosstalk between the gauge field and the scalar field, which looks weird. So my uh, idea is: can I rotate this away, this mixing, by choosing? Uh, my gauge transformation parameter alpha to be related to phi 2. Can I do that? And answer is yes I can. Okay. So you say a mu goes to some b mu. Uh, I'm just deliberately writing uh, different symbols as that it has a different physical meaning that's why it, I'm writing it differently. So a mu goes to some b mu which is related to a mu minus del mu of alpha which is alpha is this. So del mu phi by gv. Now if you multiply gv throughout okay what you have gv a mu minus del mu phi you get these two terms del mu phi and gv a mu okay with exactly opposite sign so this particular two things combined just becomes my b mu and then i'll replace wherever a mu is there i can replace right in terms of b mu so what i'm doing i'm basically eating up uh, my phi 2 in the definition of my uh, gauge transformed field now I had the gauge symmetry which says that I can choose any alpha okay I could have chosen any alpha now when I'm writing all these things and to make sense of say I can talk about a mu being a correct degrees of freedom correct massive degrees of freedom with this being the mass only if it has the form of the Proca equation uh, or the Proca Lagrangian okay so this F derivatives all the quadratic in f minus is there and quadratic in f minus is there anything else if a mu mixes with something i better I do a diagonalization first so to say so when i try to diagonalize it first so to say by doing this transformation okay then i basically in end up eating phi 2 from all this theory so basically what happens is that phi 2 is not really my degree of freedom over here it is basically b mu which is a transformed field okay so when i'm talking a mu in terms of here although it appears to be massive it actually have two degrees of freedom 
and where do I lose one degree of freedom is by choosing alpha to be not random because alpha is was completely different parameter completely independent parameter okay uh, that's what gave me the gauge uh, symmetry and that's what made the photon uh, having only two degrees of freedom because any alpha was spun out okay so only two physical degrees of freedom was there now I'm constraining my alpha to be equal to another degrees of freedom phi 2 okay so for alpha is related to phi 2 so it's as if I'm smuggling away phi 2 from the my counting of degrees of freedom and shoving it up inside my a b okay and once I do that this this equations would clean up a bit okay but since I'm using this particular notation which is not polar symmetric and my actually potential has this nice symmetry so this won't appear very nice if I do this transformation it will look ugly okay so uh, what one does is look for the polar representations okay so what does polar representation would have is that phi of x and right is 1 by root 2 v plus eta x and then exponent so this is the radial part and uh, exp then exponential of i xi by zeta by 2 okay zeta by v I'm sorry okay that because the exponent has to be uh, dimensionless now if you expand this for small value of eta and xi what you get is that the term 1 in exponent will just give me the first piece and then i xi by v when it multiplies okay uh, the, when i xi by v and v cancels and then you have i xi and the next terms is a product of eta and xi and they are higher order okay but they are all there i'm not saying they are not there okay so again i have this weird closing brackets basically this closes square and this closes round okay now if i do this approximation then this eta is what roughly phi 1 prime that we have been talking about and xi is roughly phi 2 now you see xi is an exponent thing and it's appearing over here so it is it is appearing in a non-linear fashion okay but if i stop at just the linear pieces assuming them to be small then they resemble exactly my parameterization of five fields that i did over here okay so yes it has uh, in a small uh, phi case and if i use uh, all these things that uh, product of these two fields is small and throw it away then of course i can get to what i want to uh, but uh, uh, it's better to do the computation in in the uh, in the uh, representation so now I say that let me have a, a transform field so phi goes to phi bar which is phi bar is related to phi with this exponential transformation so this exponential is just the opposite of this it cancels so my xi sorry my phi bar becomes 1 by 2 times v plus eta okay, so this is phi bar just this becomes and if, under this transformation a mu goes to b mu which is a mu minus del xi by g mu because this is uh, the way we have parameterized and that just gives the del mu phi is just this uh, because it's a covariant derivative so this comes to the left and phi becomes a phi bar and this d mu is also written in terms of b now not a mu so this when i write explicitly this phase factor times uh, this uh, del mu phi di bar and minus igb phi bar okay now you do the expansion of this so del mu phi bar if you act by del mu on this only eta will contribute so 1 by root 2 eta and then this g b and then phi bar is just v plus eta by root so this is how you write and when you just do the square d mu phi d mu phi dagger this this phase factor simply disappears okay and what you have in fact even at the del mu level you see you have eta you have xi and you have b okay but xi is appearing in a way that it simply disappears from my algebra so it's as if i'm making the phi to disappear so i only have etas and uh, square of this term uh, will be this because i times i just take mod square of this and then you expand this the square then you you have this delimiter delimiter and then the square of the v will give you the mass term same as earlier nothing changed then the square of eta term will give you the four point interaction with eta which is like phi one and there's a three point interaction so these are the interactions that will be there okay and now if you compute the degrees of freedom so i have for the scalar case i have just eta one of them then b mu has two transverse a mu and the zeta included in it. b mu is now massive degrees of freedom 
like a Proca uh, Lagrangian, you can use exactly. Now I can use Proca Lagrangian because there is no quadratic in field at any term which is quadratic in field involving B with something else. So B mu is, 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 uh, is a field which is not mixing with anything else. All the mixing has been removed by this some ray definitions of these fields. Okay, so these ray definitions are more accurate because here I'm not making any approximation about xi being small or eta being small. Okay, I'm not making any approximation. I'm just writing the full thing. Okay, so this is my uh, degrees of freedom, and at this point, I would say that uh, uh, we we should have some homeworks related to this, and homeworks will involve like if I write my phi in this manner, then uh, what would be the mass term? So you can very easily see that mass term appears from uh, phi dagger phi, okay, m square phi dagger phi, mu square phi dagger phi terms, okay, and uh, phi dagger phi will not have xi in it. So xi is actually massless field. But if you wrote everything in terms of phi one phi two, then phi one mod square will, uh, sorry, phi mod square is phi one square plus phi two square. So phi two and phi one both had the same mass. So there's one big difference between the Cartesian parametrization and the polar parametrization is the mass okay so uh, in the cartesian both the fields uh, real fields had the masses okay and equal to each other while here uh, in this polar coordinate things the mass of uh, radial part is to be computed by you in your homework and uh, the the, uh, the polar part actually doesn't have any mass okay so it has kinetic piece because you can act by del on this and uh, there will be a piece where del acts on this guy so there will be a kinetic piece but there is not going to be any uh, uh, any mass term for that okay. but uh, when i do the redefinitions basically that that field simply disappears okay so that field is nowhere there and uh, you can see that what, the transformation that i'm doing over here is del mu of size appearing okay so wherever you see b mu b mu okay is basically b mu is this guy so when you write b mu b mu whole square then you actually have del mu psi del mu psi so that is the kinetic piece that has been absorbed already the kinetic piece of xi is actually absorbed in in this mass term over here okay so when you expand this you'll get those pieces and the interaction of xi with b mu at the linear level which we had earlier over here right the way this mixing term that i was talking about the same mixing term will appear over there but here it's more exact, uh, exact in the sense that it is exactly removable by this, this nice transformation. So this particular transformation is what uh, in literature is saying, said that the gauge boson ate up this so-called goldstone boson, okay, and became massive. So it ate up a scalar. And why it's called goldstone boson? So it's all the, all the massless degrees of freedom that you have for the scalars, so all the polar direction or the angular direction uh, are called goldstone modes and the, the radial direction is called the higgs mode so what we have uh, uh, at the end is that eta is the excitation in the radial direction and that remains so the higgs boson remain so eta is my higgs boson and the goldstone boson gets eaten up by the corresponding gauge boson and the gauge boson became massive so this is in a way that i started with a Lagrangian which has all the good property of gauge symmetry so I can do a lot of nice computation in this Lagrangian okay it's just that I chose a different vacuum expectation value with different minima and so that doesn't mean that my Lagrangian has uh, not doesn't have the gauge symmetry it still have it it's not manifest because a vacuum is not symmetric okay because I'm choosing a vacuum vacuum in a way vacuum could have been anywhere around on the you know, lower circle but I'm choosing it to be one point and that particular choice is basically baking the symmetry okay so the gauge symmetry is not manifest although it is there and uh, it's not manifestly there and uh, in terms of number of degrees of freedom we are the same we have uh, 2 plus 1 3 for the b mu and only one for the scalar and basically one transfer of uh, degree of freedom from the scalar sector to gauge boson sector has happened in, in this uh, way of doing things and before I finish this thing I would like to highlight this that uh, everything that I did in this lecture today was pure classical field theory there's nothing quantum about it okay if you try to do in a quantum mechanics quantum mechanical way you have to be very careful about the fact that the field and its conjugate momenta 
do not commute okay so you have to do it very systematically or even at the classical level when you are dealing with a corresponding poison bracket you have to make sure that you know all those poison brackets and the constraints are properly taken so with that i finish this lecture and there will be some homeworks that i will upload soon uh, regarding this computations and uh, some of the questions over here and uh, you will uh, uh, okay so we will meet next uh, in the lecture 22 when we talk about the non-abelian version of uh, of this thing because non-abelian version will have more than one gauge boson so i will be able to break uh, the symmetry to make all of them massive or i will have the opportunity to partially break my gauge symmetry only partially break and uh, uh, a bigger symmetry group breaks down into a smaller symmetry group, a subgroup of, uh, of the algebra or the symmetry group. So some of the gauge bosons became massive and some of the big gauge bosons will remain massless because their corresponding symmetry is still there. So with this I close this lecture.